ವಾಸುದೇವಾಯ ಓಂ ಜ್ಞಾನಾತಿ ನಿರಂಜನಾ ಶಲಾಖಯ ಚಕ್ಷುರು ಮಿಲಿತ ಮೇನ ತಸ್ಮೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರುವೇ ನಮಃ ಶ್ರೀ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಮನೋಭೀಷ್ಟ ಸ್ಥಾಪಿತ ಮೇನ ಭೂತಲೆ ಸ್ವಯಂ ರೂಪ ಸದಾಮಯಿ ಸ್ವಾಪದಾಂತಿ ವಂದೇ ಓಂ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರೋ ಶ್ರೀಯುತ ಪರಕಮಲ ಶ್ರೀ ಗುರೋನ್ ವೈಷ್ಣವಾಂಶ ಶ್ರೀರೂಪ ಸಾಗಜಾತ ಸಹಗನ ರಘುನಾಥ ಅಮಿತ ಸಜೀವ ಸಾಗೈತ ಸಾವದೂತ ಪರಿಧನ ಸಹಿತ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ದೇವ ಶ್ರೀರಾಧಾಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪದ ಸಗನ ಲಲಿತ ಶ್ರೀ ದಿಶಾಕಾಂತ ಹೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಸುರನಾಸಿಂಧೋ ದೀನಬಂಧೋ ಜಗಪತೆ ಗೋಪೇಶ ಗೋಪಿಕಾ ಕಾಂತ ರಾಧಾಕಾಂತ ನಮೋಸ್ತೆ ಸಪ್ತ ಕಾಂಚನ ಗೌರಂಗಿ ರಾಧೇ ಲಾವನೇಶ್ವರೇ ವೃಷಭಾನುಸುತೆ ದೇವಿ ಪ್ರಣಮಿ ಹರಿ ಪ್ರಿಯೇ ಪಂಚಕಲ್ಪೂಭ್ಯಶ್ಚ ಕೃಪ ಸಿಂಧೂಭ್ಯ ಪತಿ ಪಾವನೆಭ್ಯೋ ವೈಷ್ಣವೇಭ್ಯೋ ನಮೋ ನಮಃ ನಮೋ ವಿಷ್ಣುಪದಾಯ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಪುಷ್ಟಾಯ ಭೂತವೈ ಶ್ರೀಮತೆ ಭಕ್ತಿ ವೇದಾಂತ ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ ನಾಮಿನೆ ನಮಸ್ತೆ ಸರಸ್ವತಿ ದೇವಿ ಗೌರಮಾನಿ ಪ್ರಚಾರಿಣೆ ನಿರ್ವಿಶೇಷ ಶೂನ್ಯವಾರಿ ಪಾಶ್ಚಾತ್ಯ ದೇಶ ತಾರಿಣೆ ಜೈ ಶ್ರೀ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಚೈತನ್ಯ ಪ್ರಭು ನಿತ್ಯಾನಂದ ಶ್ರೀ ಅದ್ವೈತ ಗದಾದ ಶ್ರೀ ವಾಸುಡಿ ಗೌರ ಭಕ್ತ ವೃಂದ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ ಹರೇ ಕೃಷ್ಣ 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 ಹರೇ 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 ರಾಮ ಹರೇ ರಾಮ 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 Welcome to our continued study of Bhagavad Gita. So today we'll be discussing the first half of chapter 17 uh, entitled The Divisions of Faith. And um, at the 16th chapter, at the end of the 16th chapter, uh, Krishna, or I guess at the beginning and the end, he says those who follow Shastra Uh, are devas um, and those who do not are demons, asuras and it's pretty black and white the line of distinction um, so Shiva Baladevi Devushan comments on the introduction to this chapter uh, that you know for those who study the Vedas and follow their injunctions uh, who try to understand the meaning uh, and have faith you know in the authority there certainly the devas and those who don't are the asuras but this question is what is the position or the question that is leading krishna to speak this chapter uh, after speaking chapter 16 is but what is the position of those who you know haven't comprehended the text of the vedas um uh, who out of lack of uh, diligence um you know abandon the teachings Uh, and worship the demigods or others. Um, and, and so they have some kind of faith, uh, but where do they fall in relation to the above guidelines of Asuras or Devas? Um, and so, you know, answering this question, taking into consideration the, you know, the neglect of the ultimate truth of the Vedic injunctions. Um, but they do have some faith, uh, some sincere faith. Um, And so typically this faith is based on some worldly traditions, maybe some family traditions, um, but uh, uh, not necessarily uh, faith uh, based on what is coming in the Vedas. So what, what, what happens to them? Uh, or where do they fit in the Vedas? So that's really the, the, uh, the transition from chapter 16 to 17. Uh, Krishna is now going to answer this. So this chapter in essence is a, discussing the middle part of that Danian tree. Uh, from chapter 15. You know, chapter 16 shows the, the top of that Banyan tree uh, and the bottom, the Asuras and the Devas. And now uh, we're going to get to the, you know, not too high, not too low, kind of right in the middle. We could say, you know, the common, uh, those most people, uh, where they might fit within this um, uh, section of, of the material creation. And so that's the divisions of faith that will be discussed. And it's a very practical chapter, as we'll see, uh, to be able to understand um, you know, kind of where we are based on some different actions. Okay? So in the first verse, Krishna, uh, Arjuna is asking a question. Arjuna inquired, O Krishna, what is the situation of those who do not follow the principles of Scripture but worship according to their own imagination? 
Are they in goodness, in passion, or in ignorance? So here Krishna uh, Arjuna is asking about those who have faith, but not necessarily faith in the Vedic Shastras. Um, they faithfully follow some rules, but not necessarily rules within the scriptures. So, you know, we saw in the fourth chapter, Prabhupada uh, reminds us of this in the beginning of the purport, that in the 39th verse, that Krishna said, again, remember the fourth chapter is transcendental knowledge. Uh, that is that chapter. He says, one with faith gradually gains knowledge. Uh, and with knowledge, one can achieve perfection. So that's the, you know, the, the big um, uh, statement Krishna made in the, in, in the fourth chapter, that uh, with faith, one leads to knowledge and perfection. So the question here now is, with this type of faith, will lead to the same outcome. And so Prabhupada uh, summarizes in the purport in kind of only four aspects to Arjuna's questions. Um, the first is, you know, are those who create uh, some kind of God by selecting, you know, some human or other personality to worship, what mode are they doing it? Is it in the mode of goodness? Is it good mode of passion? Or is it in the mode of ignorance? So that's really the first question Arjuna is, is, is asking. The second is, well, do these people attain perfection? Uh, the perfection that Krishna described in the fourth chapter of the 39th verse, will they, because they have faith, will they achieve perfection? That's the second uh, question that Arjuna is asking. The third um, is, is it possible for them to be situated in real knowledge uh, and elevate themselves, uh, as mentioned again in that 39th verse? Um, so, is it possible for them to come to that point of real knowledge, that transcendental knowledge? And then the fourth question that Arjuna uh, is asking um, is, do those who, you know, don't follow the Shastra but have some type of faith uh, and worship some demigods or others, do they get any success in that effort? And, and so that's the, um, uh, kind of the four questions that uh, Arjuna is asking in this opening chapter that Krishna will answer throughout the remainder of this chapter. So the first six verses of this chapter uh, talk about faith in worship in the three modes. And then really the most of the remainder of the chapter from se verses 7 through 22, um, Krishna is going to talk about four other activities that fall within the three modes. Uh, the food one eats, the sacrifices one performs, the charity one does, and the austerity. Um, and so you can kind of take these four activities, food, uh, sacrifices, um, uh, uh, worship, uh, sorry, uh, charity, and austerity. Um, take these four, and you can kind of categorize them by modes of goodness, passion, and ignorance. So you can almost create a four by three matrix. Uh, and really, uh, it, can, it, it can help us identify, you know, where are the modes that are most predominant uh, with all of us, um, you know, with anyone that we're not sure. Okay? So, this, uh, in the second verse, Krishna begins to speak. The Supreme Personality of God had said, according to the modes of nature acquired by the embodied soul, one's faith can be one of three kinds, in goodness, in passion, or in ignorance. Now hear about this. Shashila Prabhupada opens um, the paragraph, the, his purport, with a very nice statement that says, those who know the rules and regulations of the scriptures, but out of laziness or indolence, give up the following these rules and regulations are governed by the modes of material nature. So, um, if we follow the scriptures, uh, we know one is then transcendental to the modes. So, um, that's a, a very important point, that one who follows the injunctions of the scriptures, they are beyond the modes. So they're not in goodness here, because the ultimate conclusion of Shastra, we know, is to worship Krishna. We'll talk a little bit more about that. In, in, in a little bit. So, Prabhupada talks in the purport nicely about how one comes to the different types of faith one has uh, in a particular mode. Right? So we acquire in nature uh, a set of qualities due to our past interactions with the modes. Um, and that leads us to a certain type of mentality, uh, a philosophy, a belief system. And that leads ultimately to our, our faith and mode of worship. Um, so it develops from, again, our interactions with the modes. It leads to a certain type of consciousness mentality, which ultimately leads to our faith and type of worship that will fall into one of these three modes. 
and for O5 rights and, and, and throwing it in the report form, that one can change their nature though by associating with Guru uh, and following the instructions of the spiritual master, one can elevate, transcend to the professional stage. So regardless of where our faith uh, and worship may be, maybe even in the modes of ignorance, uh, by association with the spiritual master, one can elevate uh, to the highest platform of pure goodness, the Shuddha Shakti, uh, that we'll talk about. So, but one must do so by associating with Guru. Uh, following our own whimsical ideas will not result in this type of elevation. Uh, but if we follow the rules and use our intelligence to carefully uh, evaluate things for Oprah rights, uh, one has to consider things carefully with intelligence. So not just going whimsically, but again, with careful consideration, then one can uh, change and elevate the modes, and ultimately one can transcend to the platform of pure goodness. Okay? Third verse. O son of Arthur, according to one's existence under the various modes of nature, one evolves a particular kind of faith. The living being is said to be of a particular faith according to the modes he has acquired. So again, um, you know, our previous actions in the material world, they give us a certain nature at birth. Um, and that leads to a certain type of faith um, in the mode. So now, again, one can always do perform devotional service uh, to improve or elevate our consciousness. So this faith uh, is, is there. And, and, and Prabhupada, again, opens the purport uh, with a really powerful and important statement. He says, everyone has a particular type of faith regardless of what he is. And so this is important. You know, sometimes people say, oh, you know, you spiritualists uh, are full of faith. Well, we're all full of faith. Every single personality, whether you're an atheist, a theist, or in between, you have faith um, in so many things. Uh, one cannot live in this world without some type of faith. You know, I'm sitting in this room, I have faith that the ceiling is not going to, you know, fall in on me. Otherwise, I could not peacefully be situated in this room. I have faith in whoever built this um, building that the roof is, 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 is sturdy. I have faith that the inspectors have confirmed it's sturdy. You know, so we have faith in so many things, um, regardless of our philosophy uh, or our spiritual inclination. So it is not a question of whether I'm a theist or not. Uh, it is simply a mere fact of human existence uh, that you have. So the only question is, where is that faith? Um, um, is, is it in the mode of pure goodness? Is it in the mode of goodness, in the mode of passion, or in the mode of ignorance? Um, and so that's uh, you know, an, an important philosophy. And, and Prabhupada writes that based on the type of faith we have, uh, we associate with certain types of persons, and certain types of persons who share our own, uh, our similar philosophy with that faith. So our original position of faith is in pure devotional service. Uh, because we are part and parcel of the Supreme Personality of God and Lord Krishna, we are originally transcendental. Uh, we are in Shuddha Shakta, pure goodness. Um, and that faith is in Krishna, the Supreme Lord. Uh, but we have forgotten in, in coming to the material world, uh, it has been covered uh, by the illusory potency, and thus, we have now acquired lower types of faith, either in the mode of goodness, in the mode of passion, or ignorance. But again, our original faith uh, was centered in this pure goodness, uh, being faith in the Supreme Personality of God. So this is um, uh, the faith we have. And in the faith in the mode of goodness, passion, or ignorance, we should understand it to be, in, in some ways, it's artificial. Uh, it's temporary. It's a manifestation of this material world. In the spiritual world, everyone's faith is there in Shuddha Shattva, pure goodness. So the faith we experience in the material world, it is again temporary, like everything within the material world. It is not our real existence, just as the banyan tree being reflected in the pond is not the real tree, it's the reflection of reality. So our faith in the modes of goodness, ignorance, or passion are also reflected. They are, in some ways, artificial. And so our, our, our faith uh, in, uh, original faith come being in the mode of pure goodness in which we know then our relationship with Krishna. And thus, 
the, the our pure faith leads us to the performance of devotional service. That is the activity of one in pure faith, and that is devotional service. Knowing I am part and parcel of Krishna, I practice devotional service. All right? Now, if I have different types of faith, either in goodness, passion, or ignorance, it will then lead to different types of activities. So again, the activity in the mode of pure goodness is devotional service. Uh, but in our conditioned life, our work, our activities then become impure uh, because it is mixed with the, uh, the three modes, not in the mode of pure goodness. Right? So in pure goodness, seeing Krishna as the Supreme Lord, um, we, have, we perform devotional service. But when we don't have pure faith, um, we, it, 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 it's developed from this contamination of the heart. You know, this idea that I want you to try to lord it over material nature, leads us to the material world, and then we become conditioned by the various modes that we spoke about in chapter 14. So, according to the position of the heart, in terms of which mode is dominant uh, for the heart, one has a certain type of faith that's established. Um, and thus we see so many varieties of faith in the world. Why, why do people have faith in so many different things? Well, it's based on each individual's interaction with the modes of nature. Um, and so that's why we see you know, these so many different varieties of types of worship. You know, we'll see uh, you know, this idea of worshiping different personalities uh, coming up in a couple of verses. But again, it's all based on the level of contamination of the heart. Uh, because with the pure heart, one is in pure goodness and his activity is fully uh, engaged in devotional service. Otherwise, we'll see all kinds of other activities. So, you know, Prabhupada writes in the, in, in, in the, in the purport, you know, really in summary, if the heart uh, is in goodness, faith will be in goodness. If the heart is in passion, the faith will be in passion. If the heart is in ignorance, the, the, the faith will be in ignorance. And of course, if the heart is in pure goodness, then we'll be situated in our original position um, uh, and, and thus achieve perfection in life. So, you know, again, if we don't follow Shastra, um, then the faith will be dictated by the modes of nature. Um, and will be directed to follow a certain way. Um, but again, everybody has some type of faith. So the faith, faith must be in Shastra and Guru to be in pure goodness. Uh, otherwise, it will come under the control of the modes of material nature. And thus won't get to real knowledge. So to answer Arjuna's you know, part of this question, you know, real knowledge will not manifest from even faith in the mode of goodness. It must come to the point of pure goodness. Um, and otherwise will be in a, in a, in a contaminated, uh, impure state, again, even in the mode of goodness. Uh, because even in the mode of goodness, it's ultimately con considered to be the beginning of demoniac because one will gradually fall down from that position uh, and it will ultimately end up in the mode of ignorance. It's very difficult to just sustain in the mode of goodness. One must, again, transcend. Just like gravity, it ultimately pulls us uh, back to earth. We may jump in the air, but we'll fall back. Similarly, one will ultimately fall to the lower modes, right? And so, the point of elevating ourselves to the mode of goodness, and remember back from chapter 14, is to transcend. One must go to the mode of goodness from whatever state we start, but then get beyond the modes to get into the mode of pure goodness. And that is through the practice of devotional service, as we saw that, that you know, verse from chapter 14, mantra yogi vachare me bhakti yogi sevaka. By bhakti, one can sagunan samikitya. One can transcend the three modes. So, you know, just like an airplane, it doesn't go to the runway simply to stay on the runway. It goes on the runway to then, you know, uh, transcend to get into the air. The mode of goodness is like that runway. It's not a place to stay. It is a place to reach from which one then one can transcend to pure goodness. Because if we don't, we'll return back to the, the lower mode. So it's a very, very important uh, point that ultimately even faith in the mode of goodness is against Shastra. Because Shastra leads us to one conclusion. Vedesha Sarvar Aham Eva Vedya, Krishna says. Of all the Vedas, I am to be known. So all Shastra, which it must lead one to know Krishna, and when we know Krishna, it leads us to devotional service. So that is the uh, really the only uh, conclusion 
and thus really what defines uh, one who is divine, is one who is following uh, the path of, of, of devotional service. So, um, final point I'll make in this, uh, in this verse is that you know, we can see where one's faith is by whom they worship. By seeing the object of their worship, we can understand which mode is governing their faith. Um, and, and, and that will be able to then determine which overall mode is most predominant within that person. So we'll see a little bit more about that in the next verses. So in verse 4, Krishna says, Men in the mode of goodness worship the demigods. Those in the mode of passion worship the demons. Those in the mode of ignorance worship the ghosts and spirits. So here we go. Right? Based on their faith, it leads to a certain type of worship. You know, in, 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 in goodness, one worships the demigods. Again, now when we say, you know, again, demigod worship, we know, is not the ultimate objective of the Vedas. The ultimate objective of the Vedas is to worship Krishna. So um, when we say that any of the faith in the three modes is contaminated, even in the mode of goodness, it is considered less. And we saw a lot of discussion in chapter 7 and 9 about how Krishna has explained that this demigod worship is not intelligent. The figyam, one's intelligence is stolen if they worship the demigods. It is an indirect worship. It is not the right way, he has said. Um, so we know that, uh, again, until one comes to the mode of pure goodness, they are in this contaminated state. Now, in passion, one worships the demons. And say, well, nobody worships demons. Uh, well, we see, you know, who are the demoniacs? Well, it's not about the horns and the fiery eyes, but anybody who is not following Shastra. They are considered demonic. Well, you know, we see how much worship is of, of, of movie stars, of sports stars. We hang posters of them in our homes, and, you know, we, we go and pay big, big dollars to see, uh, you know, some musician perform in a concert, um, and, and we idolize them in, in our, our, our meditation always thinking about them. That's a form of worship. So uh, it may seem like, oh, nobody worships demons. But we see, you know, there's so much worship of, of these different persons, but that is considered in the mode of passion. Um, and, you know, uh, fanatics, you know, people, you know, Elvis Presley, you know, fanatics, they, they dress up like him. And, yeah, sure, we can, you know, maybe appreciate the talent that exists, but the, you know, the, the, the obsession uh, that exists these are with personalities are not following Shastra. And thus, it is, you know, they're demonia. So, um, when Krishna says, uh, worship in the mode of passion, worships the, 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 the demons, uh, we can see it's actually, you know, very, very pervasive uh, in terms of the different personalities that are put up onto a very high pedestal in society. Of course, in ignorance, uh, one worships the ghosts and spirits. Um, you know, we see so many um, different... Uh, Worshippers of different, uh, again, spirits and, and ghosts, Satan, um, even Star Wars, you know, uh, different uh, types of uh, personalities. So, uh, according to Shastra, again, only Krishna is the worshipable object. Uh, that is in the mode of pure goodness. All of the worship, again, is going against what is enjoined in, in, in our Shastra. So, Srila uh, Baladevi Devashuna says that in, in these verses, two through four, um, they describe those who have given up Shastra, you know, really out of laziness. Um, uh, well, because maybe the worship requires, you know, too much work. It's too troublesome. But they do uh, faithfully worship the, the devas, the, the demigods. So now, in, in verses 5 and 6, um, it's going to speak about those who have completely given up Shastra. Um, uh, they don't just whimsically do it, but they just are uh, completely against the Vedic practices. So they are overtly against them, not just, uh, you know, whimsical, not just, um, you know, uh, not following that laziness or indolence. So this is what the, the next two verses will describe. So in 5 and 6, uh, Krishna says, those who undergo severe austerities and penances are not recommended in the scriptures, performing them out of pride and egoism, who are impelled by lust and attachment, who are foolish and who torture the material elements of the body, as well as the super soul dwelling within, are known to be uh, are to be known as demons. So here are demons. Okay? 
those who uh, do things against Shastra are considered demonic, um, as opposed to uh, the previous mentions who you know, maybe are not following out of some laziness or maybe some other attachment. Um, so here, uh, people manufacture their own ideas of austerities and penances. Uh, they're not in Shastra. And, and when the, the, any austerity or penance one does, there must not be any ulterior motive. Um, that is very, very bad for us. Um, you know, sometimes there's a political motive. Maybe there's a motive of wanting some fame uh, or to create some uh, you know, emotion from somebody else. So when one puts the body under any type of austerity or penance for these, mean, for these reasons, it is against Shastra and is very detrimental for oneself. Uh, because the body is ultimately a temple. Uh, this, this Paramatma, Lord Krishna is sitting in our heart as Paramatma. And so the body is housing him. And so when we do some fasting or austerity, um, it must be done for some purpose of spiritual advancement. Of course, there is great um, you know, advice for following Ekadashi and different fasting rituals, you know, simple living, um, as, as some reasonable austerities uh, and penance that one can do uh, that is meant for spiritual advancement. Uh, but otherwise, if one does uh, some austerity for any other means, it is very harmful. You know, to torture the body uh, in, in, in severe fasting uh, or severe types of cold or heat uh, for, again, you know, either fame or, or, or some other purpose is actually creating a very difficult environment for Paramatma to be sitting in our body, in our heart. And so it is not a very... Um, good thing to do. It is actually very dangerous for one's progression um, because we're not uh, creating a good environment for the super soul uh, to, to be present within us. Um, and again, if the motive of that austerity or penance is, is not to please Krishna, then um, it is considered demonia. So one must be very careful that the austerities and penances one follows is enjoined in Shastra is based on our spirituality. And sometimes even in devotional life, through some fanaticism, uh, we you know we see some you know maybe you know extreme you know followings of austerity and penance uh, that is not even recommended in shastra. So we want to make sure that again all of that we do uh, is is is, is followed. We'll see a little bit more about this later. Um, so um, these um, now the point of the modes before we get into you know, the next section, which is going to start talking about the foods and ultimately the sacrifices, the charity, uh, and, and, and whatnot that one does in the different modes, you know, we have to remember uh, that uh, the modes that we have, we are a combination of all three. Uh, we're not influenced by only one mode. We're not squarely in goodness, passion, or ignorance, but that we're a combination of all three. But usually, uh, there's one that is predominant within us. So one may be predominantly in the mode of goodness, but have tinges of passion and ignorance. Or one may be predominantly in the in mode of passion, but with some tinges of goodness and, uh, and ignorance. So, you know, Srila Prabhupada explained uh, in the third canto of Srimad Bhagavatam that it's a little bit like, you know, the, the, the primary colors. You have three colors, uh, and from three colors, you can make you know, uh, three other colors, or a total of nine, by mixing them. And so now I have nine different varieties by mixing different you know, uh, of the three colors. Now if I take these nine colors and mix them nine different ways, I have 81 different colors. And like this, this can go on exponentially uh, by mixing these different modes. So the, um, the permutations of all the different modes, it creates a very complex situation for Lord Brahma as the empowered creator to facilitate all of the different natures that exist uh, in terms of the different extent of contamination by the modes. Um, and so uh, we see this in a very nice description in, 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 in Srimad Bhagavatam that um, it's actually a very complex web of the three modes uh, and the permutations are virtually infinite in terms of how each of us have almost our individual unique blend of the three modes. But again, in all of it, we will see one mode that is predominant. Um, and so do not expect that all of our activities will be squarely in one of these modes. Uh, we may have you know, some tinges that kind of uh, fluctuate between the three, 
but typically one will be uh, most predominant. And the point of understanding this is for us to understand where am I and then make progress to uh, transcending, to moving to the higher modes of goodness and ultimately to pure goodness. Um, and so this is very beneficial uh, for those who have not yet come to the platform of devotional service um, and are looking to try to bring uh, the higher modes. And even those who are practicing devotional service, um, you know, working to ensure that some of the tinges of the lower modes uh, are not present within us. Okay? So verse 7. Even the food each person prefers is of three kinds, according to the three modes of material nature. The same is true of sacrifice, austerities, and charity. Now hear of the distinctions between them. So, um, you know, what somebody's saying, well, if there's no worship or, you know, a, 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 a type of faith that one can see, then how do we know what mode we're in? Well, even without the, the worship, one has certain foods they eat. Um, they do certain sacrifices, certain austerity, certain types of charity. So based on those activities, we can see the modes. Um, and again, the point here is to identify where we are and work to go to higher platforms and ultimately to uh, the mode of pure goodness. Because all, all three modes, goodness and uh, passion and ignorance, they are again in defiance of Shastra. Because Shastra tells us to worship Krishna. Anything uh, aside from worshiping the Supreme Lord uh, is considered to be uh, in defiance of Shastra and in, in, in a contaminated mode. Because uh, the mode of goodness still is within the material uh, realm. Uh, and, and so very, very important for, for us to keep reminding ourselves of that. Okay? So verse 8. Foods dear to those in the mode of goodness increase the duration of life. Purify one's existence, give strength, health, happiness, and satisfaction. Such foods are juicy, fatty, wholesome, and pleasing to the heart. So these are modes in the uh, these are foods in the mode of goodness. Uh, they are foods that are healthy for the body. They extend the duration of life. You know, they purify. Um, they look nice. They look very you know colorful and vibrant. Um, and this is really you know milks and fruits and vegetables and grains. Um, these are all, you know, foods in the mode of goodness. Uh, when we see fatty, uh, Prabhupada comments in the purport of 10, that this does not refer to animal fat, but it refers actually to milk fat, uh, which is very beneficial uh, for, uh, for, for the body. Um, and, and, and so the, um, th this is the, 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 the foods that, again, are very healthy and that extend life. And that healthy, according to some modern science, but according to our, our, our Vedic system. And again, fruits and vegetables and, and, and milk products uh, and grains, these are the recommended items and they are in the mode of goodness. And um, it, it's important uh, also that the foods we take, um, you know, when the ingredients are pure uh, and they're cooked with purity, uh, they actually purify the mind. Um, they purify one's existence, as Krishna says. The body and the mind remain very clean, um, and we should know that you know the consciousness of the cook actually enters the food we eat. So whatever the consciousness is of one who is cooking, if person one is very very much in the mode of passion, and they are cooking, uh, that 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 mode will enter into the food we eat, um, and that's why it's very very important that we only take to the honoring of prashada. So even honoring foodstuffs that may be, you know, in the mode of goodness, but if it is not offered to the Lord, we know that the consciousness of the, of the, of the cook that went into making those foodstuffs will enter and it can even bring it to a lower mode. And we know from chapter 3 that even eating foods in the mode of goodness that are not offered to Krishna is, he says, verily eating sin. So to truly be free, because to pluck an apple from a tree, you know, creates some pain for that tree. There's some pain. It's a living entity. Um, and so to, to be truly free from all the reactions of our eating, one must come to the point of uh, being in the mode of pure goodness. Because even eating foods in the mode of goodness without uh, transcending carries some reactions. And the only way to become free uh, from all reactions from our eating 
is to only honor Krishna Prashant. Uh, because when we offer foods in the mode of goodness to Krishna, he then purifies those foodstuffs of all reactions and, uh, and, and I, I can say embeds his spiritual potency into those foods and thus it actually becomes now an action of devotional service. So you know, eating for all of us becomes very, very easy. Um, and when we honor Prashad, uh, it is actually an action of devotional service and it is purifying uh, uh, significantly for us. So it's important that we take to the process of only honoring Krishna Prashad uh, and thus avoiding even the contamination from the mode of goodness. And of course, we can only offer to Krishna what he accepts, Bhaktanam Pushpam Pramam Koyam. He says that he accepts those four items, leaf, fruit, flower, water, if yomi bhaktiya prayachati, if it is offered with love and devotion. So while these are in the mode of goodness, our goal is to honor foods in the mode of pure goodness, and that is Krishna Prashana. Otherwise, there is still some level of reaction, some sin, even from eating modes, uh, foods in the mode of goodness. 19. Foods that are too bitter, too sour, salty, hot, pungent, dry, and burning are dear to those in the mode of passion. Such foods cause distress, misery, and disease. So, Srila Vishnu Chakravarti Thakur comments that you know, we see this distress, misery, and disease. So, what is the distress? Uh, distress is when there's pain while eating. You know, so hot that it burns. Um, that it burns. That's the, that's the you know, uh, distress that we're Misery, um, you know, one becomes very depressed or lethargic. Oh, I ate too much. Um, you know, my stomach hurts. Uh, that is the misery uh, when one is consuming food in the modes of passion. Uh, or disease, you know, when we eat too many uh, uh, foods like this, it creates disease in the body, ulcers and, and acidity and different challenges of the digestive system um, and diabetes and other things. So uh, that is the disease of so this distress, misery, and disease, uh, it, 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 um, it manifests from eating these foods in the mode, mode of passion. Um, and so foods that are very addicting, um, you know, chips and cookies and things that we just can't, they overwhelm the senses. Um, they cause pain afterwards or we get sick. These are all in the mode of passion. And we know many, many examples like this chili. Um, verse 10 foods prepared uh, more than three hours before being eaten food that is tasteless, decomposed and putrid, food consisting of remnants and untouchable things is dear to those in the mode of darkness so those in the mode of ignorance enjoy eating decomposed foods, putrid foods, tasteless foods, old foods um, and so these are fully in the mode of ignorance you know this is flesh eating meat uh, is fully in the mode um, and so, you know, we should remember that uh, the, the purpose of food is to increase the duration of life, to purify the mind, to give bodily strength um, so that one can serve Krishna nicely. That is the purpose of food, you know, uh, not to satisfy our social needs or just to satisfy the tongue. Um, and, and we see that, you know, one should eat to live, not live to eat. It's a very important distinction. Society has come to this point of, you know, we're just living to eat nicely. But actually eating is for the purpose of giving the body and the mind purity and strength so that it can be engaged in devotional service. So we should establish a very good purpose for our eating. And of course, honoring Krishna Prashadam is the greatest opportunity we have. So, um, you know, now when we see this, this verse, sometimes we see, you know, Prashadam, um, if it's more than three hours old, does that make it a mode of ignorance? Um, or if um, you know it's been remnants, um, is that uh, is that uh, contaminated? So we should know that prashadam is always pure, even if it's days old. Of course, we cannot imitate, but you know the austerity and dependence of Raghunath Das Goswami. He would eat and honor the uh, the the remnants from Lord Jagannath that was uh, not saleable in the market. 
that even the cows were not taken. He would take that, wash it, and then eat it. Now again, we cannot imitate such activity of the pure devotee, but it speaks to uh, and it illustrates that prashadam is never contaminated. Even if it falls on the floor, uh, even if it touches the mouth of a hog, it is always pure because it is uh, the direct mercy of the Supreme Lord. Uh, and so prashadam is very here, of course, we should be very practical in understanding that um, and you know, uh, understand that we may not be able to you know, honor things that have maybe come to the point of becoming spoiled, so don't take it to the extreme. Um, and it's our responsibility to ensure that we honor all prashadam before it spoils, but if it does, find an alternative means um, for other living entities to enjoy that uh, and be practical. Uh, but understand, though, that that prashadam is never contaminated. This three hours is important that we should know that whenever we cook for Krishna, we should offer those items within three hours. We should not cook um, and then uh, wait too long for those to be offered. Um, that is um, very, very uh, important injunction. So as we prepare items, we should offer them very fresh uh, to the Supreme Lord. Of course, there are certain items that are meant to be offered over the long term, follow you know, some of the guidelines that are given uh, in our different um, um, you know, manuals and things like that for more details. Okay, now uh, moving on from food. Everybody must be hungry now. Uh, I'm talking about all the different food stuff. Uh, verse 11. Of sacrifices, the sacrifice performed according to the direction of Scripture as a matter of duty by those who desire no reward is of a nature of goodness. So sacrifice in the mode of goodness uh, one is doing it according to Shastra, not, uh, not doing it out of duty, not looking to get some reward for it. Uh, do it because one knows it is right. That is um, uh, a sacrifice done in the mode of goodness. But in the Passion, we see in verse 12, but the sacrifice performed by some, for, excuse me, but the sacrifice performed uh, for some material benefit or for the sake of pride, O chief of Bharatas, you should know to be in the mode of passion. So, you know, when we do sacrifices to get something, you know, we see many approach even Krishna this way. You know, I'm coming. We want something in return. It's a business relationship. That is in the mode of passion. Um, you know, many people will do different sacrifices, you know, for show. Look how, you know, how generous I am or how, you know, faithful I am. So the purpose is not to please the Lord, but it is to uh, obtain some fame. Uh, or, or some economic benefit. This is all sacrifice done in the mood of, or in the mode of passion. And finally, in 13, any sacrifice is performed without regard to, uh, for the direction of scriptures, without distribution of prashad and spiritual food, without chanting of the Vedic hymns and remuneration to the priest, and without faith is considered to be in the mode of ignorance. So, uh, sacrifices must be done according to Shastra. There must be you know, distribution of prashad. There must be you know, remuneration, uh, charity given to the priests, uh, hymns that are chanted. So any sacrifice done without these is considered in a mode of ignorance. Basically, uh, these are you know, different sacrifices done whimsically. Uh, again, the rules must be followed um, in order to be in the higher modes. So this is the sacrifices, so we've covered, you know, uh, the faith, the worship, the foods, and sacrifices in the three modes, and Krishna will continue uh, in the remainder of the chapter talking about some, you know, the charities and penances uh, that fall into these three modes before he summarizes, uh, and so that'll, that'll take us to the end of this chapter, which will uh, begin next week. Uh, so this concludes today's verses. Uh, thank you very much. Any uh, questions or comments, discussion uh, in today's uh, section, 13 verses? Thank you.
Yeah, yeah. So an an ancestors are not ghosts and spirits. Um, so the ancestors would be uh, again, in, 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 yes, as you said, in the mode of uh, the mode of goodness. Um, there are different circumstances for you know doing different ceremonies um, uh, that lead to you know again a fulfillment of their journey. Um, and, and, and so um, that is uh, that that is in, in, in the mode of you can say goodness or could be in the mode of if you're worshiping them as the supreme lord or worshiping them as your object so um, remember there's a distinction between worship and respect so um, you know worship is one Christian mom ache up respect is for all right? so even the demigods even the you know uh, the Worship is one. So when we say, you know, one should respect their ancestors, their parents, of course, you know, one has to appreciate the great gift that they have given us um, and the facilities in this life. Um, but uh, again, our worship is to Krishna. And so our respect and love for our parents, for, for example, is how we can connect them to Krishna. Uh, because that is what will give them. Greatest gift we can give them is not, not a new tie on Father's Day. It is a set of jumper beams. Um, they're going to figure out what's practical between the two. In some way, we can engage them in devotional service um, uh, because you know uh, a bouquet of flowers for mother uh, is nice, but uh, a garland offered to a Chuchi Rana Pujiari is devotional service. So um, that is how we want to ultimately. Yeah, and you can pray for them. You know, pray for their, you know, their uh, connectivity to the Supreme Lord. And, and remember one thing: your practice of devotional service is directly, not indirectly, directly opening the doors of the spiritual world for them. And uh, Lord Nishimide gives that in a very direct statement to uh, a lot. When he asked that Lord Nishimere to forgive his father, Hirakashifu, who clearly was not destined for the spiritual world. But, but Nishimere uh, clarified. He said, Due to your devotion, my dear Pallad Maharaj, I have delivered 21 generations prior. So our own devotional service is the greatest uh, reciprocation and love we can show to our ancestors. It is not out of a selfish motive, but out of the motive of opening the doors of the spiritual world for them as well. That is the greatest honor and love we can show. So keep, keep chanting. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna. Hare Well, um, if 
you like cricket and I like tennis, does that divide us? Everybody has likes and dislikes in the world. So, but we know that um, we're all bound by the single fact that we are all the part and parcel of Krishna. We all have one Supreme Father and we all have one eternal Sanatana Dharma. There's not multiple Sanatana Dharma. There's one Sanatana Dharma. And that is to be the loving servant of the Supreme Personality of God and Lord Sri Krishna. So that is the fact that exists. And we should have full faith in that in our heart. Now, as we encounter um, you know, those who are um, possessing faith in distinction or difference to their Sanatana Dharma, you know, we can understand um, that they are not different from us. They are also part and parcel of Krishna. So we're all unified. By, we're all in one family, and we have one occupation. That's the eternal reality. And our mission out of compassion is to try to shine a light for those who have misguided their faith um, to other areas and bring it back to the right track. Just like somebody who is about to drive off the road, what do we want to do? We want to try to help them stay on the road so they don't end up in the ditch. So, um, the idea then that you know people are saying that hey you know because you have faith is dividing us. Well, we can explain that actually we have one uh, common thread amongst all of us. And you know again based on what, what they're ready to hear, you may not be able to get everything I just said. Um, that uh, you know you can you can thread them by okay, well, we're all bound by this idea of ananda, wanting happiness. Can we all agree that we all want happiness? Nobody wakes up saying, I want to be unhappy. Okay, your faith is giving you happiness. My faith is giving me happiness. Aren't we still pursuing the same goal? So faith is not dividing us. Just like you may like cricket and I like tetanus. That doesn't divide us. We just have different interests. So, um, but don't compromise the fact that their faith is wrong. That's a fact. Now, you may not be able to present it in such light, but out of love and compassion, we can try to guide them to the right faith. So don't, don't compromise or dilute your understanding. When Krishna says, Ma may come, he doesn't you know, mince words. He says, Sarva Dharma. You abandon everything else. So, that is the fact. We only have one eternal occupation, and that is to serve Krishna. Because we are part and parcel of it. So that, we can't dilute that by accommodating other faiths. But we can show compassion and love to those who have maybe misguided faith by slowly, in some way, bringing them That's how you know, we, we can approach this you know, concept of device of faith. That's not true. There's diverse tastes and interests in so many things. And, um, but ultimately... It's extremely important in, in presenting this knowledge. Two, two things we have to keep very strong, and we, we often make this mistake um, when we begin to share this knowledge. So you know, just hold these two things very important uh, in, in your consciousness as you begin to explain this to others, whatever, this or any topic. One, 
we must always know what is that person able to receive at that time. So the dosage that they can take. So we may not be able to present everything at that time because you'll scare them away. So knowing what they can do. But, very important but, you can never at any point compromise the truth. You have to do both together. You can't say, yeah, it's okay that you are worshiping X, Y, Z. It's no big deal. No, that's not true. That's because it is not good for them. So we can't dilute the truth in the presentation of what's digestible for them. So the skill and the art of explanation is going to be not compromising the reality, Knowing that fully in our art, but presenting it in a way that doesn't, you know, brings them steps closer. So, uh, because sometimes what we do in trying to accommodate all the other views is we dilute the reality. And the reason that's not good, it doesn't help them. Because ultimately, they'll not get to the point of mommy come share with you, which is the perfection of life. So, don't dilute the message. But don't avalanche them with information that's going to bury them and stop them from making progressive steps. So you have to do both together in order to have some success. And knowing what's too much, what not too little, that's why unless we really surrender to Guru and Krishna um, in, 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 in that process, uh, we'll never be successful. So one thing to remember, prashadam, regardless of time, is always pure. It's, it's always pure. But to, to take the topic of that, you know, if you, if you, if you speak to an Ayurvedic doctor, they'll tell you that the refrigerator is the worst invention for all of us. Because of that exact fact. That it promotes the uh, ability to eat foods beyond the rightful time that it's there. So <clears throat> the you know in our traditional system it's the best. Daily going and getting the fruits and vegetables for that day, preparing them, offering to Krishna and honoring them, and the next day doing the same. No storage. That is the best. Now due to the advancement of Kali Yuga, it's not always practical that we can do that. So, you know, we use these tools, but we should understand the best is to not uh, store things because it doesn't uh, retain it as, as, as purely its beneficial um, properties. So, the, the technology is there, but it doesn't make it good. So, uh, that's how I would answer that, and that's how again, just, and that's, and everything I just presented is purely from from a biology standpoint, from a medical standpoint, not from a spiritual standpoint, but from a medical standpoint. So, uh, a, a vegetable refrigerator is taking it out of its natural state. Anything you take out of its natural state will alter its effectiveness. So yes, it'll preserve it but it's less beneficial, less nutrients 
than if it wasn't. Now we have, again, practical uh, limitations due to the advancement of Kalila, and so we have to use refrigerator. Uh, and we don't have a choice. But that doesn't make that fact, uh, an, it's not an advancement. Yeah, any of the, you know, different uh, ceremonies that we do, um, you know, um, whether it's to the forefathers or, you know, um, different types of um, uh, sacrifices that are enjoying in, in the Vedas, um, that are, again, those, those progressive steps towards serving Krishna, um, that we do out of duty. It's the right thing to do. So the consciousness is, I'm doing it not because I want some material gain, but it's my responsibility. You know, doing a finda ceremony is just taking an example. Um, you know, that would be in the mode of goodness. It's not devotional service because it's not you know aimed at pleasing Krishna, but you can do that ceremony in that mode. But typically, it's done out of you know this mode of goodness. So th those are the types of ceremonies or sacrifices that we do um, that are uh, considered in the mode of goodness. And the distinction, again, between goodness and pure goodness is pleasing Krishna or not. Okay? Yeah, so it, 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 it Yeah, so because the the demigod worship that uh, is enjoined is is there for the you know the reciprocation to the demigods for their facilitation of our existence here. That is the purpose. As soon as we enter the desire for some material fruits, some benediction, some wounds, then it becomes an Though the the object of our worship is in the mode of goodness, the purpose of our worship, our sacrifice, becomes in the mode of passion. So that that's how we, you know, un un understand that. That's why even, you know, our devotional service to Krishna, right? Um, it, it has these tinges of this mode of passion when we go to Krishna for something. But again, Krishna says. That person is very pious, even if they come to me in want of money. Right? So the object may be in the mode of goodness, but the 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 mood may be in the mode of passion if there's some desire for some you know thing in return. You know, the example of like, you know, um, uh, um, I think you get the point. Yeah, actually just explain because many times I I've had this encounter with friendship. Thank you. 
Yeah. It, yes, but just one correct one correction to the statement I'll make is that it's not the same as worshiping Krishna. So, because again, the worship of the demigods, Krishna himself says, is the incorrect means, is the indirect way. So even if the motive is not. Um, for some personal benefit, it's still not the right mood of worship. So it's better, it's better than worshiping them for material means, but it's not equivalent to worshiping Krishna with a mood of no desire. So just to make sure we clarify that. So you had you're exactly right. Those who worship the demigods out of again sense of duty, it's the right thing to do. Um, that isn't the mode of goodness, but ultimately. The worship of Krishna is the perfection of our worship. Yeah, yeah, I understood that. So therefore, so the ones who are actually worshiping Krishna, they are not in the mode of goodness there at all, right? Because they have been happy, as you mentioned, they are transcending the mode. Even if those sadhakas actually are just transcending the mode, then they are actually trying to worship Krishna, then it can be considered that she can be paid back or no. Yeah. Uh, 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 so that's the important point that worship of Krishna is beyond the modes so mode of goodness is just a point to come to to then transcend one must transcend so like, absolutely so devotional service is beyond the modes now in our practice of devotional service we may bring these consciousness of some of these lower modes but that is what we are working to purify from but the activity of devotional service is transcendental to the modes of material nature. Mode of goodness is still a contaminated mode. But less contaminated than passion or ignorance, but it is contaminated. It is impure. We may even worship Krishna for some motive. So that is what we are working to purify from. Hare Krishna. Nevertheless. Okay, anything else today? So next week we'll continue uh, with chapter 17. Thank you very much. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Nanta Koti Vaishnavanda Ki Hare Krishna.